encountered the Kati trilogy in undergrad. I think I was at a party and I think I was playing in the background or something while people were drinking and, you know, doing other mischievous things. And it was on silent and it was just like this beautiful imagery projected on a wall. I started taking images quite seriously around 2007. And I remember also simultaneously being obsessed with film. And once you start following your own sensibility, who knows where it's gonna lead you. The Kati Trilogy is a series of three films that explores the capacity for visuals to express or represent or translate reality. One of the first things it did to me was put into question the standard way in which human beings engage with the, the visual field. Film is catered to 24 frames per second in order to provide that illusion that we go through every day when we're walking around. Godfrey Reggio's use of time lapse and slow motion quite literally alters one's relationship to understanding what it is to see and what it is to know. The first one has a lot of time lapses, a lot of slow-mo. The second one explores indigenous communities across the global south. And the third, he's using faces and they're spinning and he has brands coming up and there's these bitmaps of globes and it's all translating and blurring and merging together. The way in which I got it was that we've created another world that's actually post-society perhaps. When people look out into the world, we're taking in a trillion gigabytes of data, but we're not able to process them and it's not useful for us to process them. And so we sort of like hone in on one thing. So we sort of remove everything else in the background, but it's kind of like always there. One of the primary things that Godfrey Reggio does is he brings the background to the foreground and makes you contend with the entire visual space. There's a moment in Pawakati in which there's a young girl walking with a pink dress at the bottom of the frame. She's carrying a red pail. And behind her, there's this huge wall. And I think it says, long live the war of the gorillas. And she stops and then like locks eyes with the camera. I mean, it's a mind blowing experience. She offers like a sentience to that frame. It's almost as if she knew that we would be watching or wanted to confront the power of the camera's gaze. There's, this, there's something transactional that happens in that moment, which becomes even more fascinating in Godfrey Reggio's framing because with him using the background as the foreground, the foreground as the background with music and with the visuals, you're supposed to contend with the entire thing. And so you have these words in the back that are looming over this girl while she's staring at you. And you know, there's immediate implication with your relationship to world domination, Western ideology, the arms trade. I mean, who knows? It's pretty devastating, but it's quite beautiful as well. This guy, Alan Watts, he has this thing that he says, what's the right level of magnification? When I look through a telescope, when I look through a microscope, when I look through my window, when I look through a camera, what is the right way to see the world? Godfrey Reggio's work with scale is as vital as his work with the background foreground. He's focused in on a small, seemingly like a detail of a flower or something, and he just like slowly zooms out. And as you zoom out, then you see that it's on a hill, but you think that it's just a hill and he continues to back up and back up and back up. And then you've gone from the micro to the macro and you're seeing that this is an entire town couched in between these mountains and on these hills. And it takes a long time to get there and it takes a kind of backing up for you to do which is something in terms of the social political world is, is quite pertinent, right? It's, you know, your proximity to something could possibly um, hamper your ability to see the bigger picture. Your bigger picture could probably dissuade you from understanding what it's like to be close, to be a person inside that framework that you're talking about or that you're legislating towards. The brilliance of the Kati trilogy and something that I tried to apply to Hell County is that it takes the political as the default. 
A work like the Katsu Trilogy, I think, comes from a desire to speak towards truth without forcing truth down someone's throat. Perhaps one of the most important things we can do to critique ourselves is to use a mirror as not a way to improve our looks, but as a way to actually see ourselves. Got my bodyguard now. Got my bodyguard. I was talking with the critic and programmer Eric Hines about Hell County this morning, this evening, and W.E.B. Du Bois's idea of the veil. W.E.B. Du Bois is this black intellectual from mid 1800s, early 1900s. He's a radical thinker at that time. He's just, you know, against slavery and for equality. He has this idea of the veil, which is the idea that Americans are behind a sort of sheet that doesn't allow them to fully view the world. And that is the sort of identity and the homogenous community from which they live in prevents them from participating in a world that is fluid. I love this idea of the veil, specifically as it relates to Hell County. forcing you to contend with the culture of being racialized either as white or black. And I definitely see similarities between the way in which the veil functions in Reggio's films. I think what the Katsu trilogy has initiated is a way to be in the world. Experience is knowledge. Like that's where all knowledge comes from. And the Katsu trilogy does that. It builds this tapestry of strange visual things that you can't help but have a sort of visual reaction to. In the same way that if you drop a sort of rock in a well, you make ripples. You know, you, you say a word to someone and it produces more words. Same thing with imagery. All imagery is in dialogue with all imagery. It's the nature of imagery. He shows a tracking shot of a woman walking through a doorway in a hut. She looks back at you. It's profound, it's moving, but you can't help but think about where you live. You can't help but think about the state of homes across the world. I think it shows that the ideas that are sort of fermenting, if not overflowing right now, existed before. The world is built, and it's been built over a really long period of time. And the place that we are now is connected to the place that happened not so long ago, that Godfrey Reggio was talking about the environmental issues that seem to be of the utmost importance now, then. But also, you know, you look at the footage of the, I think perhaps it was Detroit, the big buildings that are hollowed out and are ruins, and you look at the state of some of the countries that we would call third world, and you start to see a trend, and perhaps the reason one could argue why there's now a new digital reality. Maybe we're losing space in the physical world. The idea that human reality is literally constructed, perception is literally evolved and organized for survival are things to always keep in mind. You have to know what things are made out of in order to deconstruct them and change them. It doesn't happen without knowing how they were built. And there's, there's some nuggets of truth in the films.